you feel bad for next year because I'm here? This is on the video. Thanks for that. Shots fired.
playoff then? Absolutely not. So they just stayed there knowing that we can't win, but we're just going to no. win. So, right. So our whole thing was, okay, our, our troops have no way, there's no way for us, we don't have enough ships in the Philippines to evacuate our troops. We just don't. I mean, it's very limited what we have there. Um, so we have no way, and we have no forces that could get there in time to evacuate them. So we knew they were lost. Our thought was, just like what a lot of people in fighting Germany, like what happened to France, is that a lot of the forces would be captured and they would probably just put in um, POW camps. That Japan would put them. We actually have no idea what Japan's going to do, which is in our story tomorrow, not today. Um, that was our assumption, was that they'll probably fight valiantly and then in the end they'll have to surrender, which is what we did. And then we'll be taken to POW camps and when we're ready, we'll come get them. Um, because we don't have the forces to evacuate them. So, well. I know, it sucks to be if you're on the station in the Philippines right now. All right, so those are our plans for this first year. It is also in this first year that Franklin Roosevelt is constantly in communication with England, and our leaders made a decision. It's a little controversial, and a number of top military leaders are going to tell Roosevelt it's a bad idea. And the decision is that we are going to fight all three of these enemies until we obtain unconditional surrender. It's not surrender, it's unconditional, which means you don't set terms. And the reason why top military personnel, some of them were leery of this idea, was what if then Germany's like, okay, okay, okay. Or Japan is like, okay, 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 we'll get out of Southeast Asia. That would be setting a term, that is not unconditional surrender. They're going to surrender, giving up completely. Surrendering, unconditionally, no terms, no negotiation. So that could, prolong the war. But the decision's made. That is what we're going to do. Alright, so in the meantime, while we're on the defensive, while we're doing all of these things, we also have to decide what we're going to do and who we're going to fight first. Because we can split our forces, fight Japan, fight Germany, fight Italy, but that weakens us. There's strength in numbers. So the smartest thing would be to keep all of our troops together and send them to fight one enemy. Now, my guess would be, if you were alive at the time, most Americans are like, that's a no-brainer. We're going to take down Japan, little backstabbing jerks who you know, bomb Pearl Harbor. But if you're the one in charge, for those of you who are going to be in charge one day, because I know the future president's in here right now. Don't forget about me. Um, you, well, you have this to live forever. So <laughs> there we go. Um, you have to look at big picture. You have to look at where can the most lives be saved. You have to look at where is it going to be the most beneficial for our troops, the easiest point to get to. So we narrow it down to is it going to be versus Japan or Europe? That's what we have to decide. And even though I know most Americans are thinking we need to go out to Japan, there's bad guys here. They're the ones who killed Americans at Pearl Harbor. We all saw the images. Um, big picture wise, it just makes more sense to go liberate Europe first. We will save the most lives. Uh, Russia's getting slaughtered. England's getting bombarded. We've already lost the Philippines. We can hold, if we can hold off Japan like we're thinking, then it makes sense to go to Europe first. So our thought is once we're ready to go in November, we're going to go to, Euro to liberate Europe first. The American put in charge of this campaign is General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Yes, he will become president later, but for right now, he's literally the general who's in charge of liberation of Europe. So Eisenhower and his like group are looking at, we have three ways that we can join the fight in Europe. There's three actively fighting areas in Europe right now. First one is France. Yes, France has fallen, but we can hook up with England. And then the two of us together can go in and liberate France and then move into Germany through France. That is definitely option number one. Option number two is to go into Northern Africa and take out Italy first. So instead of going and hooking up with England there, we can have England join us in Northern Africa, and together we'll sweep through Northern Africa to Italy, take down Italy, and then move up Italy and get to Germany that way. Or option number three, we can go into the USSR, which is still fighting Hitler. Now Hitler's plan, I told you yesterday, he moved in in June of 1941, Afraid that America was going to join in, he wanted to take down Moscow before winter came. He didn't do it. He, I mean, he wasn't ready. So he found the Russians to be a significantly more difficult 
target than he thought. So they're still fighting now in 1942. So he's been there for like going on, you know, into a year. So Russia's still actively fighting. So that is option number three. So we have three choices of what, where we can go, um, and, and we're not sure which is our best option of the three in, in the European campaign. While we're trying to make this decision, something does happen in Russia. So, um, oh, did I not write it on here? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's okay, I'll just talk about it. Um, so, while we're trying to make this decision, I have to talk about what is going on. I can't believe I didn't write it on the board. What is going on in Moscow? Oh, I did write it, it's right here. <laughs> I'm just lying. Um, so, <laughs> Moscow's the capital of Russia. If Moscow falls, Russia falls. So, Russia has made it all the way to Moscow. So they're like bombarding Moscow. And Moscow is fighting back. And they're like, like fighting back. And what Germany can't figure out is why it's taking so long to take Moscow down. Like, it's like Moscow's not that big. It's like taking on, you know, Vegas. Not that Vegas is small, but we're not LA. We're not that big. So they keep like bombarding them with all this artillery and they keep fighting back. It's like their supplies never run out. It's like Moscow has like a magic Hogwarts bag. They just keep pulling out all these weapons. And they're like, I don't get it. And they figured it out. They're like, oh. See, there is, oh. sorry, moving out of picture range to draw a map on this board. You have Moscow's over here, and then there is a huge city, like LA type city, called Stalingrad down here, and a river. So what is going on is that Stalingrad has been collecting all these supplies and shooting them up the river to Moscow, and then that's how Moscow keeps getting this like endless supply of weapons to fight back. Sorry, I'm going to move back over there. Ready? And I'm going to move it. Ready? Yeah. And okay. not so, awkward at all. Um, so Germany figures it out, and they're like, okay, so our problem isn't really Moscow. Our problem is Stalingrad. Like, Stalingrad's the one supplying Moscow, which is why Moscow hasn't fought. So if we want to win, we got to take down Stalingrad and then cut off the river, and then we can go up and just destroy Moscow. So the Germans are like, we got time, because it's only summer. And again, we got to be done by winter, right, December, because December is when, you know, the tanks won't work and the machine guns won't work and all of that. But we got time to take down Stalingrad. So Germany shifts the focus to Stalingrad and then attacks Stalingrad in September. And the people of Stalingrad understood that if their city falls, Russia falls. So Stalingrad is like the last thing and then Moscow will fall if they fall. Now, you ought to understand, yes, Stalin is evil. They don't like Stalin. But the thought of having Adolf Hitler as your leader was so bad. Like, I mean, yes, Stalin's mean, but he's Russian. Adolf is an anti-Semitic white supremacist. And so the people of Stalingrad would rather die than have Adolf Hitler be their leader. So you had not just the military, because they had military stationed in Stalingrad, you had citizens going into their homes, getting their private guns, and going to defend their city against German machine guns. And Germany's like, all right, that's the way you want to do it. And it's a slaughter. But the people of Stalingrad would sooner die than serve Adolf Hitler. And so they will fight back with everything that they can. And it is a slaughter. The body count is astronomical. The only thing that saves Stalingrad is a miracle, which if you live in you know, Russia, you're not allowed to believe in God, so you are going to secretly call it a miracle. It's September, and winter came early. There's a freak blizzard in September. September! It's like in Vegas, it's like 100 degrees. They're like, oh, it's really nice out. Oh, look, snow. Oh, look, blizzard. And so the Germans are like, they can't get their machine guns to work. Their tanks all stall and won't start. And the Russians go back home, get their parkas and their snowshoes and their little guns and come back out. And they're like, bam. You know, and the Germans are like, because ah, they can't get anything to work. So the Germans, for the first time, have to retreat from a major battle. And they're like, ah, we're leaving. But we'll be back. And... Stalingrad's like all cheering, like, 
because they're leaving. The Germans are retreating. They beat the Germans in a major battle. Of course, the Germans are like, we'll be back in the spring, man, and we're going to take you down. And Stalingrad's like, because <laughs> it's true. When they come back, they're going to come back with full force. I mean, the only reason Stalingrad won is because winter came early. <coughs> Because when they started counting up the dead and wounded in the Battle of Stalingrad, it is considered the deadliest battle in World War II. And that's saying a lot, because there's a lot of them. Total wounded, and, or total casualties, dead and wounded, for the Russians in the Battle of Stalingrad is 1,250,000. That's like the entire population of Las Vegas dead or wounded in one month. And the Germans are coming back. So Russia is like, hey America, I know you're trying to decide. Please come here. Please come here. And America's like, you know, we get it. I mean, we get it. We get that you really, really need us to come. People in Africa are sending us the same message. You know, the people of France are like, come here and we'll take out Germany quicker. <sighs> okay, we have to make a decision. So in the end, the United States decides to go into Northern Africa first. And it's not because we don't like Russia. It is our belief, no matter where we go, it will help Russia. Even if we go to northern Africa, I mean, there's already a significant Nazi force there because Mussolini's forces weren't strong enough. If we can sweep through northern Africa and come to Italy, Germany will have to send troops to fight us to protect Germany from us invading through Italy. It will help Russia. No matter where we go, it would help Russia. It would alleviate the fighting that they were anticipating in the spring. So we choose Northern Africa because we know it's going to be the easiest. We know that Italian troops are not fighting this war wholeheartedly, and there is a significant amount of Nazi forces there, and that we could sweep through Northern Africa quickly, get up into Italy, march up through Italy pretty quickly to hit Germany, and then that will help both France and Russia. So that is our plan. So in November of 1942, because remember that's when the defensive is over, we send our troops to Northern Africa. And we were 100% right. There were some battles where the entire Italian battalions would just surrender because they didn't want to fight and they, they, they don't love Mussolini. So we were sweeping through Northern Africa pretty quickly. And then in July of 1943, Mussolini is overthrown and he flees the country. Um, and he goes to Austria, which is German soil, and Hitler is so mad at him. Hitler's like, Get back down there and get control of your country. And Mussolini's like, but they don't like me. And he's like, you're Mussolini. Go down there. And he's like, you're right. I'm Mussolini. And so his plan is to go back down there. And then he's captured and put on trial and hung. <laughs> so he doesn't quite make it. Um, by the way, he is hung publicly. Like they had this like stage and like thousands of people like cheering as he's getting hung with his wife. By the way, they hated her too. Um, but the best part is that like after he's dead. Like, they, like, someone jumps on the stage and they cut down his body and throw his body into the crowd, and the crowd is just, like, beating him and kicking him. And he's dead, <laughs> I assume. Um, so they just, they, like, desecrate his body. When Hitler found out, he was like, oh, 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 oh. like, they would do that to their leader? Like, oh, yeah. Hitler's like, okay. So, in July 1943, Mussolini is overthrown, and then the new Italian government switches sides. So yet again, in the World War, Italy switches sides, again a new leader. And so that makes us in England so happy, because we've been fighting the Italians, and now they're on our side. So all we have to do is kind of just finish kind of like sweeping through Northern Africa, which is going to be really even now, because the Italians are on our side now. And then when we get to Italy, they're on our side. So we can just literally just march straight up through Italy. That's the plan. And we're so happy. See, I even drew a happy face. Happy US and England. Yeah. Um, Hitler's not stupid, he's like, oh crap. So, Hitler invades Italy. And then what he does is once his troops move in there, they're basically like, we're ready. So they're waiting for us. So once we sweep through Northern Africa and we get to Italy, we face what England and France have been talking about for the last couple of years, the full force of Germany's war machine. It's a lot harder than we thought. It actually takes America and England a year and a half to get up Italy. We were hoping to do it in like a month. And so our plan of like just shooting up Italy and taking on Germany that way, it, it's not happening the way we thought. We are detained a lot longer in Italy than we expected to be. Um, so that's the 18 months here. 
In the meantime, we're going to try to weaken Germany's um, war machine by crippling or destroying a lot of their munitions depots. Like if we can destroy even like the railroad tracks that they're using to transport troops, to transport weapons, then we can slow them down. If we can bomb munitions factories, then we can slow them down. So that's the plan. The problem is the Germans have anti-aircraft um, weapons. So as planes fly over, they're shooting them at us and they're destroying a lot of airplanes. So the Americans have created, they, it's like uh, not really a computer the way you think of a computer, but it is a computer in the very most elementary sense of the word where you can program in air, your height, how, what is it? Elevation, your wind speed, I mean your velocity, and then how far your target is, and it can tell you when to drop the bombs. There's only two in existence, and we have one of them here. However, um, it doesn't make a difference if our planes are being shot out of the air. <laughs> and by the way, our, all, the pilots who were here, Roger Tippett, who is, by the way, the pilot of this plane, um, understood that if they're shot down, they will destroy the machine. That's the way it's going to be. Because that machine in the hands of the Germans would not be good. So they came up with an idea. Because our machine is so good, we could bomb by night. Because at night, they can't shoot us out of the sky. So we're going to try, I'm sorry, by night, by day. By day, we're going to try to do it. The Germans have been trying to do it at night for the same reason that the Germans can see you and they'll shoot you out of the sky. So they've been trying to do it at night, but it's hard to see your target at night. We're thinking we can do it during the day. And people were like, it's really risky. Like, if the Germans see your plane, they're going to shoot it out of the sky. We're like, we know. but but we can see our target, and we know exactly when to drop the bomb. And once we drop them, we can get out of there. And they're like, okay, England thinks we're kind of crazy, but it is what we do. It is the first really daytime bombing against Germany, and it is successful. I mean, and by successful, I mean we, we hit like 50% of our targets, which was considered amazing for the time. Um, the first pilot who did this is also the pilot who will drop the bomb on Hiroshima. One of our best. Now, we start bombing them during the day. England continues to try to bomb them at night. We're trying to weaken them. We do this for about a year. It's all happening right around the same time. So we're in Italy, we're trying to get through Italy, and then we're bombing them at the same time. By 1944, we have drafted so many more men and trained them, and we're ready. So in 1944, Eisenhower decides we need to open a second front. It's time to split the, the German forces. They're still fighting the Russians, they're fighting us in Italy, now we need to open a second front. We do have two options, we can join the Russians. With our numbers plus the Russians, we would overwhelm Hitler. Our other option is to go into France with England and force Hitler to split his forces against the Russians and us. That's option number two. Russia had no doubt in their minds at all that we would go help them. If you look at the, the costliest battles in World War II, they are almost all fought between the Russians and the Germans. Stalingrad is the worst, but there are many others. And so, I mean, you don't understand how many millions of people like Russia has lost by now. Helping them would help save so many lives. But America chose to go to France. And our, our choice is logical, all right? We're gonna, I mean, it's gonna help Russia. We're splitting Germany's forces. So it will help the Russians overcome the Germans where they're fighting on the Eastern Front. Russia did not see it that way. Russia saw it as France fell like freaking four years ago. And you're going to help them? I guess Russian lives don't mean that much to you. We will, this, will, this, this whole thing, right? We're leaving for the Cold War? Um, you gotta understand Russia, how Russia thinks we feel. It's not why we did it. All right, but that is how they feel, and I can kind of see their point, right? I mean, a lot more Russians are gonna die now because Americans chose to go that way. All right, so there's two ways in, either with England through France or to the USSR, and we choose England-France, which makes the Russians really mad. So we begin to send our forces to England. Between the US and the UK, we mobilize about three million troops in London. That's insane. Could you imagine three million troops in Vegas? Not, not just no, three million. That's like more than our population. And where are they to stay? 
I mean, where are all these people going to stay? There's American and British troops there. It's crazy. Um, there's lots of, like, like all kinds of gossipy things that happen around there, but we're not going to get into that. Just know it's a lot of them. Eisenhower made sure that Americans that were on their way to England read all this British-like literature so they could understand that when we get there, the Brits are a little different than us. So you have to be sensitive to that. And we're staying in their city, on their soil. All right. So we mobilized about 3 million troops there. We know where we're going to land in France. It's going to be on the beaches at Normandy. There's five different beaches we're going to land down, hopefully simultaneously. What we don't want is the Germans to know that that's where we're going to land. We tried our best. All right, to send all kinds of decoy messages, knowing that they would intercept them and decode them. And all of our decoy messages implied we were going to be landing in different places, like Calais. And so we were hoping that the Germans would intercept these messages and decode them, and then be like, oh, the Americans don't know, we know this, that they're going to be landing in Calais. Um, they were definitely ready. So the day of the Normandy landing goes down in history as D-Day, even though it's technically Operation Overlord. And the first day of any landing is usually known as D-Day, but this is like the D-Day. Like the biggest amphibious landing ever in the history of America, all right? This is like the most that we've ever had. We had three million troops ready to go. We can't land them all at one time. We don't have the vehicles that can get us there. Um, so, if you wanted to see the best reenactment of the landing at the beaches of Normandy, you need to watch about the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan. Steven Spielberg, when he made the movie, interviewed all the survivors of there that were willing to talk to him about what they saw, what they heard, everything, so he could create the most accurate reenactment he could of the landing at the beaches of Normandy. I'd love to show it to you, but it is rather rated R. Um, but you can. It's really good, though, if you haven't seen it. Oh, the movie's sad, by the way. <laughs> but it's good. Um, but the first 20 minutes, if you're like, I just want to see the beaches of Normandy, just, ah. OK, it's really good. Um, but our troops were overwhelmed. The, the Germans were waiting for us. They had um, landmines on the beaches. They had machine gun nests throughout waiting for us. Our soldiers are being pissed. Like, the, like that's it right there, our soldiers. All right, falling from the wall, they're falling down. Why? Because they're being attacked. We had to drop them off, like in rafts. So they were in the water, carrying their guns up here, marching onto the sea while machine guns are firing at them. We had um, barrage balloons. They're like these giant, they look like blimps that we had men carrying on. And it sounds odd that we would have men like dragging these giant barrage balloons, but the hope was that our German aircraft then, they, it like blocked our troops, so that German aircraft coming in, shooting at our troops would hit the balloons instead of our troops. Um, but the people carrying them had, they couldn't use a gun. So they're dragging these onto the beach, completely open to machine gun fire. Um, Omaha Beach is considered one of the worst the landing at the beaches of Normandy was, at, up to, I mean, just a disaster. But troops kept landing every day. So it starts on June 6th. The next day, we land more. The next day, we land more. The next day, more. Within a month, we have a million troops on land. And we just overwhelmed them. The Germans ran out of ammunition. Remember the plan, outproduce the enemy. We just have a lot more ammunition. We have a lot more of everything, more soldiers, more everything. So we, over, we do overwhelm them. But those in that initial day of D-Day was just a massacre. Um, but necessary. If we don't do this, then we have no way of getting our troops onto the shore. All right, and that is in Normandy. So General Patton's in charge of US troops who landed in Paris. Eisenhower is in charge of the whole thing. He's also in charge of what's still going on in Italy. Remember, we are still fighting in Italy. So Eisenhower is not in the action. He's the one like directing it. Patton is the one who is actually in Paris, who's the one directing the action in, Paris, uh, in France. We need to get to Paris. Like, the Nazis took over Paris a long time ago. We need to get it back and give it back to the French government. That's where we're heading. Because once Paris falls to the Allies, Germany will flee out of, Germ out of France. So they're on their way to Paris. So once they get to Paris, and there's the fight for Paris, um, we are so high in numbers, we overwhelm the Nazis in Paris and we retake Paris. 
Initially, the, the French were very happy, and then Americans were kind of snotty sometimes. So there was some friction in Paris, too, but you know, it is what it is. All right, after Paris, we've got the Nazis on the run, so we turn, and we are going to push them out into Belgium, and then from Belgium, we'll enter into Germany. So as we're going, you hear like General Patton, like, we're keep going, we got him on the run, we gotta keep going. And you have some of his men be like, um, sir, like we should probably wait for our supplies to catch up to us. And he's like, no, we got him on the run, we gotta push him as far as we can. They're like, okay. So we push him out of France, and we're like, ah, we're pushing him out of France. We get into Belgium, and we're like pushing him. I mean, literally, Belgium's only this big, it's not gonna take us that long, we're gonna push him out of Belgium, and then we are going to enter German soil. So we get to Belgium, and we got him on the run, and, and, and we run out of gas. Like literally, we ran out of gas. So they're like, okay, and now we're just like chilling in Belgium eating chocolate. I guess there are worse things. But we literally have to wait for our supplies to catch up. So we're like, all right, just kind of chilling. Belgium, kind of cool. Never been to Belgium. Kind of chilling. Kind of how our troops felt right about now. Okay, so while they're chilling in Belgium, there is a um, election in the United States for president. An election. An election. <laughs> um, November 1944, Franklin Roosevelt is going to run for his fourth term in office. Like, that's just insane. Seriously, a fourth term. And he wins, like, with no problem. But he's the one who got us out of the Depression. Well, technically, World War II did, but he's the one who kind of got us into World War II. Um, but we're winning. Right, we're pushing the Germans out, we're, we're winning the war, so, you know, he's defeating Hitler, so yay, Roosevelt. So Roosevelt does win his fourth term in office. Um, and so Americans, you know, in Belgium were like, hey, did you hear this? Yeah, Roosevelt won again. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Want some chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> so while we're waiting, Hitler's like, ah! Like, literally, the Americans are about to enter German soil in his home. Austria. But they're entering in Germany, and, and he's the leader of Germany. And so Hitler is like taking Hitler youth who are like 15 and 16. Because remember, by the time you're 15 and 16, you know how to use a gun, you know how to take directions, you're perfectly beloved of Hitler, and deploying them. Because he needs to defend Germany. So in December of 1944, Germany attacks the Americans who are stranded in Belgium. This is known as a counteroffensive because technically we started it on the offensive, we invaded them, and then now we got stuck and they were like countering it. So now they're offense, being on the offensive. So Germany launches a counteroffensive. This battle becomes the bloodiest battle that the Americans have seen in the war to this point. It is the Battle of the Bulge. Actually, it might be, I have to look at the numbers, it might be the deadliest one for Americans in all of World War II. Um, Hitler is fighting with everything he has. This is his last defense of his homeland. If he loses the Battle of the Bulge, we enter Germany. So the battle rages on through um, January. America does have almost 200,000 casualties in this one battle in just over a month. Okay. Or almost 200,000. I don't remember the exact number. It's like 180 something thousand. Um, while we're like bitterly fighting for our lives here in Belgium in the Battle of the Bulge, the USSR is sweeping through Poland. So they're defeating Hitler's forces in Poland. So they have kicked the Nazis out of um, Russia and now they're in Poland heading towards Germany. So finally, by the time we get to 1945, Germany is being entered by the Americans from the west, we're coming in through Belgium. From the south, we're coming up through Italy. And then from the east, coming through Poland, the Russians coming through Poland into Germany. So, I mean, Germany, and on top is water, so there's no one coming that way. Um, so, I mean, Germany's losing for sure. So, Americans can kind of take a breath for a moment, all right, that we're actually winning, and that we've got this, and that, you know, any minute now we're going to capture Hitler, and it's going to be great. Um, none of us have reached Berlin, which is where Hitler is yet, but that's cool. Um, Roosevelt is like, you have no idea how much stress this is. I mean, if you think like Obama has aged a lot in the last eight years, imagine being in charge of World War II. So he is sick. Um, he has been sick sporadically throughout the war because you know being in charge of millions of people, hundreds of thousands of which are injured and dying, is never easy on the heart. Um, he decides to take a break. He's done this a few times. 
this will be the next time he does it. He goes to a little resort down in, I think it's Georgia, um, where he suffers a massive brain hemorrhage and dies. It was completely not, not predicted. And he was with his mistress at the time, so, oh, <laughs> so um, Secret Service had to kind of clear like any, like, oh, no, he was by himself. Oh, okay. um, so his wife could come down and claim his body. Um, we are devastated. You understand, he has been our president for 12 years. This was the beginning of his 13th year. We'll never really know if he would have run for a fifth term or not. Um, but we're devastated. I mean, he's been the one who's got us through, who supported the troops, who did all of this, and now he's gone. I wanted you to know, most of our soldiers did not know this right now. And most of the commanders were under orders to not tell their soldiers. But you have to understand, if you're a soldier, how emotional that would be, and you don't need that kind of emotion on the battlefield. Um, they'll find out soon enough. All right, so Harry S. Truman will become president. We're not going to talk about him quite today. We'll talk about him tomorrow. I mean, Truman doesn't really have anything to do with this. Like, the, we're already winning. So, um, on April 12, 1945, that's when Franklin Roosevelt dies. Now, we have an opportunity to get to Berlin and take Hitler. Patton knew he could have gotten there. He could get there. He could get there. We could take Hitler. That's what we could do. Or we could hold back a little and let the Russians get there first. And we do hold back and let the Russians get there for first. Mostly, it's believed to try to like smooth things between us because I mean there's a lot of bad blood right now between us because we chose to go into France but if the Russians get Hitler then it's like a feather in their cap and it would be good for them and that could smooth things between us um, so the Russians get to Berlin once the Russians are in Berlin it's like it's over and Hitler knew it he had just recently gotten married um, so he and his wife Ava Braun went to their underground bunker that they had in Berlin, along with some of their SA, their bodyguards, and um, she took poison, and he did take poison, but that's not what killed him. Um, he shot himself in case the poison didn't work. And so he shot himself in the head, and they left orders to their bodyguards that he, Hitler was terrified because of what happened to Mussolini. He was like, if they get my body, that's what they're gonna do to me. Yeah, uh -uh. So he left orders for the his bodyguards to take the bodies, the dead bodies now, right? He left the orders for them before he killed himself. It's not a seance. Um, he left orders for them to take the bodies upstairs to the garden and to burn them. So they were burned, <coughs> and dental records will prove it was them. Um, he's not alive somewhere in Brazil. Um, you're like, yeah, he faked his death, and then he got on a plane for No, he did not. Um, so that's April 30th. So on April 12th, FDR dies, and April 30th, Hitler dies. But amazingly enough, Hitler's death is not the end of the war. Because we're going to fight until we get unconditional surrender, and Hitler's death is not unconditional surrender. So the German army has not surrendered yet, so we're going to keep fighting. And we do. Kind of waiting. And then about a week later, the German generals get together like, okay. They're like, it's over. So on May 8th, which will forever be known as the E-Day, or Victory in Europe Day, um, Germany unconditionally surrenders to the Allies. And now it is over, and we're so happy. Oh, but wait, we still have to fight Japan! <laughs> that, that's tomorrow. Well, that's Question? <laughs> Questions? Besides the fight for why? All right. No? Everyone gets it? It's clear?